During the years that I served in the Ministry of Youth for Christ when I was in the presidency, Bob Buford and his organization, the Foundation Leadership Network, invited me on two occasions, 18 months apart, to spend a week with Peter Drucker. Fifteen of us, uh, CEOs of major ministries in America, would gather in California, and Peter would sit on a table and hang his feet over a chair, not a note for a whole week, and just impart his wisdom to us. It was a very, very rich experience. It was in the late 80s, and the first time I ever heard the opening phrase in your notes that you find in your book this morning came from Peter's lips. I've heard it many, many times since. It's almost become a cliche now, but it kind of gives me the platform for where I want to spring from this morning, and also from the biblical base that Kent built for us on the study of Peter this morning. He said, managers make sure things get done right, but leaders make sure the right things get done. And I know this morning I'm talking to a group of leaders, people who are phenomenal leaders, you're great leaders, you've been successful leaders, and as a result of that, you're here this morning. When Kent and I talked on the phone several weeks ago, I said, what do you want me to talk about? He said, I want you to speak on leadership. So we're going to talk about the three R's of leadership this morning, and tomorrow in my workshop, in my workshop we're going to talk about successfully coaching your leadership team. But uh, today, as we look at this concept of the three R's of leadership, there's just a few things that I want to share with you as we begin this to kind of open this up. Robert Kriegel, in his book, If It Ain't Broke, Break It. I like that. It breaks the old paradigm, doesn't it? If it ain't broke, break it. He says, leadership by vision is to this, is to this century what management by objectives was in the 1970s. So visionary leadership is critical. People that have the ability to stay at 35,000 feet see the big picture, and lead forward. Warren Bennis shares a story in his article entitled The Sense of Mission, that he was asked by a Fortune 500 company to put together a grid, as a consultant for them, to put together a grid that would help him in the selection of their new CEO. And he all, all at once he realized he really didn't have good material, so he decided to do a lot of research in preparation for this. And he interviewed 90 CEOs, because of the nature of the business, they told him they wanted a male, and so he knew he had to deal with a man's selection process. And so he went to men who were CEOs of major corporations in America, 90 of them. And he interviewed them intently to see if he could pick up some traits and trends in these gentlemen that would help him to build the grid that he wanted to build for this company that he'd been employed by to build their grid for the selection of their new CEO. And then when he was all done with his research, he found that there was five major trends in these men's lives. First of all, there was a trend of vision. They were visionary. They could see the future. They not only saw the big picture, but they could see the future, and they could see it clearly, so they were visionaries. Secondly, they were communicators. They had the ability to communicate, not just take knowledge and impart it, but communicate it. And I know there's some educators in the crowd this morning but when I worked with John Maxwell for a few years, one of the things he always used to teach us, those of us who were talking for him and communicating for him across the world, John would always say this, you know, educators can take something simple and complicate it. But communicators take something complicated and simplify it. And there's a lot of truth in that from the standpoint educators have the ability to intellectually begin to build on that and take it apart and analyze and evaluate it and really, really get to the bottom line of what a concept or a principle is all about. But when it comes time to communicate it, we must be very straight, we must be very simple, we must use simple terms. And as a result of that, as we communicate a vision, and entrepreneurs have to do that, don't they? Good leaders do that. As we communicate a vision, we have to do it with vigor, we have to do it with enthusiasm, we have to do it with excitement, but we have to paint a picture that's very clear. And so communication was, was a second characteristic. You not only have to communicate the vision, but in ministry, you have to communicate the vision so that you pick up people who are going to help you and fund it. In business, you have to communicate the vision because you may need venture capital and all that kind of thing, or you've got to hire the right people, and you need to attract them to your business, and as a result of that, communication is critical. The third thing that they found was persistence. These leaders were very, very persistent. They stayed at the job. They took, kept their nose down, and they went through the period of, of promises. They went through the period of of, uh, of uh, problems, and then they got to the period of payoff. And once they got to the period of payoff, they were rewarded financially and many other ways as they did that. But they had that persistence in them to keep at the job. 
No, they didn't count hours. It didn't matter if it took 40 hours or 60 hours or 80 hours a week. They were there to get it done because they were, they were persistent. The fourth grade he found out from these guys that they were, they were empowering people. Empowerment. They did not try to do the job themselves. To use it in street terms, I like to say they were not control freaks. They gave responsibility to people around them. They delegated. They gave the responsibility. They gave the authority. They held them accountable for sure. But they were empowering people continually and constantly. And then fifthly, he found that they had a great sense of organizational ability. Great sense of organizational ability was very, very key, of course, for being a good leader. Vision is a necessary qualification for effective leadership. We know that you can be effective, but vision is a very, very necessary qualification today for effective leadership. A basic principle uh, based on research is that people follow leaders, but dollars follow vision. People follow leaders and dollars follow vision. That's true in the business world as well as the ministry world. I've put together here a little statement that uh, I'm convinced is very true. And it goes like this, vision without a strategy and a plan for implementation is hallucination. <laughs> Many times we have visions, but we don't ever develop a strategy to see it implemented. And if we don't implement it, it's just a dream out there. It's not really, it's not really at all a visionary leadership kind of concept because as we see in this next statement, that many leaders only hallucinate about having what? An effective strategy measurements and results. In other words, they come off first as visionaries, but in reality, they are only dreamers. In my study of leadership this past decade and even decades before, I've come to the conclusion that there are some traits, some trends in people. Warren Bennis calls them super leaders. You may call them excellent leaders or servant leaders or whatever kind of leader you want to call them with the adjectives that you want to put there. But one of the things we found is that the people who are great leaders today are first of all strong in relationships, they're strong in results, and they're strong in resilience. They're three R's of leadership. They're strong in relationships, they're strong in results, and they're strong in resilience. Effective leaders today are strong in relationships as we take a look at this first R. Touch the heart before you ask for the hand. The effective leader is very concerned about relationships very concerned about relationships at home and on the job. World Christians today are interdependent. You see across the top of page two there, it says independent, dependent, or interdependent. World Christians are interdependent, why? You know the old dovetail approach on the end of a, a dresser drawer where it gives it strength? That's what happens in interdependency. When we come together in the body of Christ, we're not operating as the Lone Ranger or the Maverick. And many entrepreneurs have that tendency, don't they? But God has planned for us as we operate interdependently. And as we interdependently serve in the body of Christ and work in the body of Christ and use the strengths of the body of Christ, recognizing that God has given us a gift mix in areas of strength, but he's also given other people an area of strength and gift mix that we need around us. And as a result of that, we have that dovetail relationship, and that's what gives us strength. It's not that button of heads or butting two boards together, but it's that dovetailing process that gives us strength. So first of all, we're to be dependent upon him, but we are to be interdependent on each other in the body of Christ. Well, first of all, we can look at this concept of relationships with family. It's pretty important, isn't it? Relationships with family. You know, we love to go to Ephesians 6. We say, children, obey your parents. Once we're a parent, we like that. We didn't like it when we were a child. <laughs> or we say, husbands, love your wives, or wives, submit yourselves to a husband. Depending what gender you are, that's how you like to preach that, and which, uh, which part of that you like to pick on just a little bit. But the whole thing needs to go back and begin in Ephesians 5, verse 21, where it says, submit yourselves to one another with love. Submit yourselves to each other out of love. As we love each other, it's easy to submit, isn't it? But when we don't love each other, when there's a block in there, or there's ego in there, there's a wedge in the relationship, and we don't love each other, then it's hard to fulfill what comes in the next chapter in Ephesians 6. So the basic foundational fundamental truth for Ephesians 6 is found in Ephesians 5, verse 21, where it says, submit to one another out of love. 
Then we also have to think of the whole concept of relationships with our friends and our colleagues. Our friends and our colleagues. Many of us have very, very tight, close friends that we just enjoy being with them. I'm sure all of us do that. We like to be interdependent with our friends. We like to relate to our friends. We like to spend time with our friends. Hopefully you have some colleagues that way as well. If you don't have colleagues that you're friends with, you're missing a great deal. You know, a lot of people say it's lonely at the top. I'm convinced it's only lonely at the top if you choose to make it lonely. Because it doesn't have to be lonely at the top. You can have great friends and your colleagues. And that's modeled to us very well at Crown with our president, Dave Ray. Because the whole concept of making you a part of the team, making that collegial approach to it, is so critical and so important as we think about this whole concept. Our daughter, Rhonda, who lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan, she's a part of a church staff at Kentwood Community Church. She's the artsy music kind of per person. And uh, she's got uh, all kinds of things kind of going for her with leadership and drama and music and programming that she does for the church and all that kind of thing. She's a great young leader, but you know one of the things that she has all over the place You'll see it on the dashboard in her car, you'll see it on her refrigerator, you'll see it in her office, you'll see it in her bedroom, you'll see it in plaques on the walls in her home, is Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. Isn't that a great passage? A friend loves at all times. No matter how hard it is, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the tension is in our leadership role, we need to be people who know how to love. Tim Melmore, in his book entitled The Soul Provider, suggests that we, in fact, he challenges us to do two things, or four things as leaders. Number one, to model. He says we must model. Model our value system, model, model, model a variety of other things, our character issues and all that kind of thing. Number two, he says we must mentor, we must pour into each other. When I left the Ministry of Youth for Christ, I started an organization called Emerging Young Leaders, and later we merged that in with John Maxwell. But in my days of leading emerging young leaders, we built a strong mentoring component. We did it for high school students, we did it for university students, and we did it for young adult professionals. And mentoring is a very important thing to me because I was involved in mentoring. I was mentored very successfully by a lot of people, including my dad. And in fact, he was my first mentor. And today, I am mentored by a man that some of you know the name. His name is Dr. Ted Engstrom. He's president of World Vision, former president of World Vision, was a former president of Youth for Christ. And in 1985, in the ballroom of the Disneyland Hotel in Anaheim, California, the night I was inaugurated in the presidency of Youth for Christ, Ted and his wife Dorothy came by me at the receiving line time and put his hand on my shoulder and he said, he always called me by my surname, he said, Wynn, if you allow me to, I'd like to spend some time mentoring you. And I was thrilled. That was... 20 years ago, and he's done it every year and every month since that time. I hear he's now 89 years of age. He has diabetes. He's lost his sight, but he dictates letters to me. We talk on the phone, and he's constantly pouring into my life, and it's always encouraging. But he also keeps me up short every once in a while. He says, I got your letter the other day, and I read this. Why, why in the world are you doing that? Tell me about it. It's a great mentor. See, the best mentors are also mentees. And if you're going to be a mentor to someone, make sure you have a mentor, because it'll sharpen you, it'll fine to you. It's that whole iron sharpens iron that Howie Hendricks wrote about several years ago. We are also to manage, it says. And then we also are to minister, no matter what our role is in life. I like the, the principle that's referred to over and over and over again in Scripture, that all believers are ministers. And you have the privilege of being ministers in a marketplace environment. And you're reaching people that no one else can reach. And I know that's why God's blessing is upon you significantly.